Is this the start of a bull run in China? During the past few weeks, China has announced a raft of policies to bolster the economy as part of its sweeping efforts to deepen reform and opening up. Various government departments at the highest level have been taking bold steps to boost capital markets and show up the real estate sector. And the markets have been very reactive. Exactly what key measures have been announced? How significant will these policies be? And what does it say about the fundamentals and the direction of China's economy. Welcome to this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, coming to you from Beijing. Joining me to discuss these issues from Addis Ababa, Professor Liang Yan, Kramer Chair, Professor of Economics at uh, William Met University in the United States. From Singapore, Professor Bert Hoffman of the East Asian Institute at the National University of Singapore. And from Beijing, Professor Xu Qinghua, Vice Dean of the National Academy of Development and strategy at Remy University of China. The warmest welcome to all of you. First of all, let's take a quick recap of all the major measures that China has rolled out. On September the 24th, China's central bank, the People's Bank of China, unveiled a bold stimulus package cutting the reserve requirement ratio by 0.5 percentage point. This was followed up on September the 29th by an announcement to cut mortgage rates by no less than 30 basis points below the loan prime rate. On October the 8th, right after the week-long national holiday, China's top economic planner, the National Development and Reform Commission, announced a batch of incremental policies designed to support enterprises, stabilize the real estate market, and boost capital markets. On October the 9th, China's central bank and the Ministry of Finance held their first joint working group meeting on treasury bond trading. On October the 10th, China's central bank announced the launch of the Securities, Funds and Insurance Companies swap facility or SFISF with an initial scale of 500 billion yuan or about 70 billion US dollars. On October the 12th, China's finance ministry had a press conference outlining initiatives to enhance the so called counter cyclical adjustments in fiscal policy. So, um, Professor Liang, what are we seeing and on what scale? Yeah, good to talk to you, Liu Xin. So I think what we have seen is uh, a package, uh, very premeditated and very targeted policies that are trying to provide liquidity to the economy, but also target some very specific sectors like the property sector, as well as the equity sector. Then we're also seeing a lot of fiscal policies um, that are trying to provide not only counter-cyclical policies in the short term to strengthen the economic growth momentum, but also address some of the structural issues um, such as the fiscal imbalances between the central and the local governments. We're also seeing other confidence boosting measures like supporting and um, promoting private enterprises, as well as some of the very targeted policies to support the needy families and the low-income families. So I would say, you know, these are really important policies. They're not only important for the short term uh, to, you know, achieve the f- around 5% growth target for the year, but also I think going from the long term, um, it will provide some bottom and stability um, for, for example, structural changes as we, you know, pivot away from the real estate sector driven growth to the more high quality growth, uh, but also address some of the social and economic imbalances. So I think, you know, these policies are very important um, in the short term and in the long term. Professor um, Hoffman, how would you characterize the mix of policy measures, including monetary stimulus and property market support policies to galvanize the economy's rebound? So uh, I think they're significant. I believe a a key target for this is really the confidence factor, as Professor Liang mentioned. Uh, uh, A stock market going up gives everybody a bit more confidence. It's important that the property sector and property prices stabilize. That's important for households, uh, households who have invested a lot in property. And so that might actually encourage consumption down the line. Uh, the third factor, the, 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 the fiscal factor, could directly give support to the poorer parts of society, to poor pensioners, to people that need the money and would spend the money. So that's a third leg in the confidence uh, building exercise. Of course, it's important that those confidence building exercises are going to be followed up by 
the structural reforms that are laid out in the third plan of the 20th Central Committee back in back in July. Mm. Professor Xu, um, you know, this is rather a spectacle, I would say, for both people in China and outside China to see such a large scale and sweeping measures rolling out r rather thick and fast, I would say, within a short period of time. Exactly what is China trying to do? Uh, you know, in my understanding, um, our current macro situation of China's economic development remains unchanged. So I'm very confident because we have the high market potentials and strong economic resi resilience. And the new policies, I think, is really uh, give the stimulus, the tooling to help us to raise our confidence, the market confidence, the people's confidence, and to release the resilience and the market potentials, I think. Mm -hmm. So it really helps. Yeah. Um, which measure? Because we are seeing a whole host of measures, as I mentioned, both to boost the capital market and the real estate, and of course, uh, in in line with uh, boosting confidence in general. But let me go to each and every one of you. Professor Liang, for instance, which measure do you think is the most significant and which has been received most, uh, you know, most warmly by the markets? Right. So I think the most immediate reaction from the market, of course, is the policies that strengthen the equity market. Um, so that's basically a swap line, also with lending facilities, uh, totally worth about 800 uh, billion Chinese yuan by the central bank to allow financial institutions and companies to purchase stocks. So that immediately create this market rally in the past weeks, as we see, you know, all the major stock indicators have gone up very significantly and foreign capital also, you know, coming in um, and that, you know, builds that positive momentum. So I think that's helpful because it creates a positive wealth effect um, for the households to spend. It also strengthened the confidence of the investors. So that's the immediate, I think, reaction that we have seen. Um, on the other hand, we are also seeing some of the early numbers, for example, from the Golden Week travel and spending data. So travel has up by 5.9% year on year and spending has been up by 6.3% uh, year on year. So that, again, shows that consumers are confident in spending their money. And finally, when we look at the um, housing market, and again, I think it's not just the reduction in the mortgage rates or the reduction in the mortgage uh, sort of down payments, but also um, some of the easing measures in the major cities like in Guangzhou, in Shanghai, in Shenzhen, in Beijing as well. So we're seeing really warm, um, you know, sign of the markets being stabilized. Um, you know, during the golden week, we have seen the floor sales number have gone up very significantly, you know, in Beijing, uh, in Shanghai, and also in some of the tier two or tier three cities, right? In Heilongjiang, in, um, also in Guizhou province, we're all seeing, you know, the floor sales have gone up year by year um, at quite significantly. So what I would say is, you know, these policies are very effective, at least in the short term. Of course, what we're needing is also, you know, the, the press conference um, from the Ministry of Finance um, that increased, you know, fiscal stimulus, because I think that it's very important um, to boost the domestic mm. demand um, and also, as mentioned earlier, address some of the fiscal imbalances at the central and local level. Yeah. So I think all these are very important policies and have very important um, uh, effectiveness. Professor Hoffman, how would you, um, which policies stood out the most to you um, in terms of the effectiveness? And uh, how would you characterize the kind of fantastic reactions that the markets have been reacting to these policies? And I do mean equity market, capital market, the real estate market, you know, the domestic tourism, it seems that overnight things are changing. So first, uh, I agree with Professor Liang that the liquidity measures that feed into the stock market has been most important for the stock market. Uh, second, I note that, that the overall measures as published thus far are not as big as they were in 2020, even 2015, and definitely not 2008 and 9. Uh, the reason for that is that China's economy is not off the rails. It has a weak spot and there's issues in the labor market, there's issues in the property market, but growth is still quite positive and it's, it's sort of the final push towards, 
towards uh, 5%. A lot of the measures, particularly the fiscal ones, will only really take effect next year because it takes time to actually spend fiscal money. Providing liquidity is easy and feeding that into the stock market is quick, uh, but the signing the programs, topping up the money for the, for the local governments and then having it spent, that simply takes time. So most of that will actually be next year. Mm. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of additional measures, one measure that was not yet mentioned in this that I found very significant is that the People's Bank bought a lot of treasury bonds in the primary, from the primary dealers in the market. Now, that makes it a bit easier for the fiscal authorities to top up the already planned special bonds issue. There's more some special bonds issue plan of one trillion. There's talk that it might be doubled or tripled, and that would give the real the ammunition for the real boost that also Professor Liang talked about, the fiscal boost. Mm. Professor Xu, um, what is the approach? How would you describe the approach of the rollout of uh, policies this time? Which one stood out for you? Um, this time, I think one one policy, for example, in response to the current difficulties in production and operation of some companies, uh, increased assistance to them. We know we have been doing lots of the field studies. For example, uh, in our uh, energy fields, uh, those innovative the SOEs, the companies, they still are very difficult to produce in their very new and edge edge technologies so i think the policies try to optimize the business environment and give big assistance to them and help them to survive the difficult the times so that is the new new quality the produ um, production and new era and the China from uh, the tradition and to the new uh, the, the, the time is very difficult the, so the policies really give a hand to this very difficult um, business and uh, enterprises hmm. some people have um not been very optimistic, let's say, about the um, systematicness of and or the, 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 the nature of coordination among all of these policies. Some commentaries, including economists, are calling the measures piecemeal, which appear to disappoint investors. Of course, they were particularly talking about the press conference by the top economic planner, the NDRC, on October the 8th, right after the National Day holiday. Um, Professor Liang and, uh, of course, the other two guests, what are your reaction to this? Um, are they piecemeal? Um, how would you look, how do you look at the reaction of the stock market, which seems to be quite fluctuating? Right. Well, I would say you can never satisfy some of these uh, commentators, right? I mean, either they said this is bazooka, it's too much, it inflates the bubbles, or they say this is too piecemeal, this is patchwork. Um, but I think really the Chinese policymakers, you know, when they roll out these policies, um, it's very well targeted and it's a gradual process, even though I know in the recent you know, weeks we have seen this you know, a flurry of, you know, policies. But again, I think they really target at the specific, uh, you know, markets or sectors in the economy that really needed some sort of stability. Um, so take the housing market as an example, there's no intention for the policy makers to walk back um, on their intention to, you know, sort of stabilize the market, but at the same time, you know, not to inflate it and go back to the old way, right? The stock market um, is the same story. Um, even though the market has been rallying, but we know the Chinese stock market has been for a long time undervalued, right? When you look at the PE ratio, even though it's not a perfect indicator, you know, it does show that the Chinese stock market has been really undervalued. So I think, you know, these policies that try to stabilize the markets and create a positive wealth effect and also to stimulate, you know, the confidence of the investors, I think these policies are very measured um, and they're appropriate at this point in time. Now, in, when it comes to the monetary policy, that just, you know, rides the easing cycle. The Fed has been cutting, ECB has been cutting. So it's not a surprise that the Central Bank of China also, you know, slashed the interest rates and uh, RRR. And finally, when it comes to physical stimulus, and again, many countries have done that, and it's very important. And for China, I think it's not only because we need some of the short-term growth momentum, but to address some of the structural issues going long-term. 
So I think all these policies are important, be they, you know, be it as it may, piecemeal or graduate approach or well targeted, but, you know, also uh, quite, you know, strong measures. Um, I think, you know, the, the jury is still out. Uh, we're just trying to see if these policies make sense when it comes to the effects on the economy. But so far, I think early data have indicated that these policies have been very effective. Mm. Professor Hoffman, your reactions? So, um, uh, I agree with Professor Liang that it's hard to please the Economist newspaper. Um, look, I, as I argued, the big bazooka is actually not necessary. That's not what China needs. Yes, they need some stimulus and to keep more or less the growth target of 5% to resolve some of the issues that are emerging in the labor market, to resolve the issues in the property market, which which is very important for the Chinese economy to stabilize it, to stabilize the prices there. But it doesn't require the size of, of stimulus that we've seen in the past, particularly in 2008, 2009. Uh, what is important, I believe, is beyond this short term announcement that there is concrete follow up of the of the more structural reforms that will bring that that counter cyclical macro policy that was announced first in the third plenum, latest in the September Politburo meeting that those reforms fall into place. And that's quite a bit quite a bit of homework needs to be done, i.e. the fiscal system needs to much more have automatic stabilizers in built in. And that requires tax reforms. It requires intergovernmental fiscal reforms. It requires different assignments of spending authorities. The authorities are aware of that, but you can't do that overnight. Second, on the monetary side, uh, it was quite clear that there was maybe a bit of delay that the monetary authorities were waiting for the Federal Reserve Bank to move. And then they had the space to lower interest rates. Well, structural reforms can give China a fully independent monetary framework within which they can decide on monetary policy for China's needs only, irrespective of the exchange rate. So that requires reforms as well. Those will need to fall into place. I think that will give much more long term confidence that indeed mm. there is more automatic stabilizers yeah. in the Chinese. Mm. Um, Professor Xu, is China mulling other measures or going to continue in the long in the medium and long term other more structural oriented measures to back up the kind of stimulus packages we're seeing now? Uh, thanks, Liu. So um, I'm sure there will be going to be the following the uh, strong policies. So uh, I totally agree with um, uh, um, the professors. They think that there are lots of skepticism about the, the effectiveness of the policies um, because the weakness in, in aggregate demand stems mainly from the deep adjustment in real estate and finance show sectors so um i think that the low, uh, uh, not only the central government and the local government uh, they are all thinking about the debts and the especially the local government debts hasn't yet uh, been fully resolved so now the policies we are thinking is the focus is a sustainable of the new policies so for china such a big and uh, the, the the economy so we are also the engine of the world economy economic development so there is a saying that it's very hard for a very big sh uh, ship to to turn uh, and turn around for example to the high quality the production so we should be very careful and we still need to be uh, released, continue to launch and, and strong fiscal policy after the current round of monetary policies and the realistic policies. But we should be very, very careful. Too strong, I don't think it's very positive for China's health, health for the economic development. For example, this policy, I keep my attention to one word is the safety or security, the policies. So it's very important. Thank mm. you. Um, how would you, how do you characterize, how, how do you judge whether uh, the policy is too much or is not sustainable? Um, Professor Xu, for instance, what do you watch out for? And then I'll go to the other two guests to get their engagement. 
Um, I think that because we have uh, comparatively a little bit closely involved into the policy, um, the, the, the the research and others. So, uh, for example, this time the measures um, uh, relevant to the the macro uh, the the policies and also including the um, how to say to try to um, upgrade the insufficient uh, effective domestic demand uh, in the beginning we are talking that uh, we, we think that the the new policies are effective and to some extent not efficient and very strong so that's i follow and say that it should be very sustainable that means that to keep the confidence not only chinese but also uh, foreigners uh, to be keeping the confidence on Chinese uh, uh, economy. Uh, what you say just uh, reminds me of what's uh, written in the decision of the third plenum of the 20th uh, CPC Central Committee when they set out this important uh, reform agenda for the next five years. There it's very carefully worded. It says we will improve the functions of the capital market to give balanced weight to investment and financing. We will prevent risks and tighten regulation to promote the sound and stable development of the capital capital market. Professor Liang, uh, I want to get your um, assessment on how is China doing this balancing act between stimulating the market and keeping things stable and sustainable for the longer term? Right. So again, I think most of the commentators, uh, when they talked about, you know, too much of stimulus, they refer to the stock market rally. But again, I agree with Professor Hoffman. Uh, we're not seeing the same kinds of rally post COVID in 2021. We're not seeing the same kind of rally back in 2015 or you know, out, out, um, after the great financial crisis. And like I mentioned earlier, the PE ratio in China has been only at about 12.8 before the, the rally, and now it's close to 14. Um, it's by no means, I think, overheated when you compare to India, right? The PE ratio is 27, the US 26, and some of the European countries, despite very ailing economy, you know, their stock market valuation is much higher than China. So in that sense, I don't think, you know, we're overdoing the sort of stimulus, at least in the equity market. Um, real estate market, I think, is the same story. I think it's a controlled demolition of the the, of the real estate bubble uh, back in 2020 when the three lines policy were implemented. But there are collateral damages when you have very slump in the real estate market. You know, the price have been going down, the transaction volume going down, and the investment have been going down for now three years. And so I think it is time to stabilize the market um, to control a little bit and limit a little bit the damages that you have done to the macroeconomic market. And I totally agree with Professor Hoffman that none of the stimulus, right, can replace the structural reforms. Um, but I would also say that these are not mutually exclusive, right? So when you give fiscal stimulus, especially at the central government level, that allowed, you know, some more fiscal transfer to the local government mm. level. So I think, you know, again, stimulus and reform, um, they go hand in hand. Indeed, uh, Professor Hoffman, without going into too many technicality and uh, details, is China's reform measure or deepening reform measures on the right track? All right, look, if I look at the, the third plan and document, uh, the, the resolution, as they call it now, uh, that is a pretty solid document, and indeed it addresses a whole range of the points that people expect reforms in. It's not detailed enough, but in the People's Daily, there was a series of articles that went more in-depth. And uh, Professor Liang should be happy that there's quite a bit on the fiscal side uh, that is being promised that will make, become policy over time, including on the social side, including on social spending, uh, and particularly this realignment of, of, of responsibilities and spending across levels of government. Uh, a recognition of the uh, debt, local government debt issues and some of these special bonds will probably be used to resolve that. So I, I see a lot of elements where I say, well, they're actually with these structural reforms, they are moving in the right direction. But it's also tough. I mean, it is these structural reforms are always tough. So that's why I agree with Professor Liang that uh, it's better to do structural reforms when you grow with 5% rather than when you grow with 3% because that gives you a bit more space to move.
Hmm. Well, talking about 5%, the other day, the NDRC press conference, one of the topic was uh, whether China will fulfill its uh, annual growth target of about 5%. Um, what is your take? Let me go to Professor Xu here. Um, why is China so confident that it's able, it will be able to achieve that target? We only have less than three months left for the year. I think that uh, the Chinese government is confident is because this time the new policies shows the characteristics, the following three, uh, more emphasis. Um, I mean, that is one is more emphasis on improving the quality of economic development. Another is more emphasis on supporting the healthy development of the real economy and the business entities and more emphasis on the integration of high quality development and high level and security. So this is very important, just as you said, to keep the balance between the development and the security. And the policy is very careful about it. It is confidence source. Thank you. All right, all right. Um, Professor Liang, about the year end target, the 5% it seems to be uh, very important. People are looking closely whether China can fulfill that. Um, are you holding your breath or are you confident that if China is not going to meet it, it's not going to say it, especially at this time of the year? Well, I think, you know, this is a very nuanced question and uh, we don't know the future. And I think the supply side is always strong and we don't need to worry about that. But I think the demand side, uh, the consumer confidence and spending has been relatively weak, uh, especially in the second, the, in the uh, third quarter. Uh, but now, again, the early data indicates that consumers are coming back and government spending would definitely you know, provide a boost. Export growth has been really strong and investment growth has been very strong outside the real estate sector. But we do know, you know, the first quarter, 5.3 percent growth, second quarter, 4.7. Third quarter data has not been out, but I think the most sort of economists would uh, believe it's growing, you know, less than 4%, which means the last quarter has to grow in a very solid pace, right? Somewhere between 9% or even 10%. Now, this is tough. It is not unprecedented, but it is challenging to achieve that goal. Um, so I think I am the I am holding breath. But that said, I don't think this year by year, sort of the growth rate is that important, right? 4.9% versus 5% growth rate is not going to be you know, making huge difference uh, in the grand scheme of things. Mm. Um, but I do believe that NRD, uh, NDRC uh, made an announcement, right, that they have the confidence to achieve that. So again, the last quarter um, is very important. And if that fiscal demand could help to boost the economy, uh, I think that would really help to achieve that goal. Mm. And uh, Professor Hoffman, um, what are you looking at now, from now to the end of the year? And uh, do you think some um surprises can be pulled by china well so first i'm a bit more optimistic on the on the third quarter i think that's going to end up above four percent but that's uh, uh not a very strong strong confidence mm -hmm. uh, estimate um with some additional boost it is uh, i think still achievable to stay within the oh. range of what is about five percent uh, the big the big uncertainty for China and the rest of the world, frankly, is the U.S. elections. And that's if I were if I were a Chinese policymaker, I would keep some powder dry of whatever I'm going to announce in terms of stimulus, because I need to have the policy space in case the U.S. elections turns out to be a negative for China, because then more stimulus is needed in the final in the final quarter. What I would particularly look at, what I'm looking at, is really developments on the labor market. I think that's that's important for the long term uh, uh, demand, mm. uh, the consumer demand, and and it's frankly it's important for the Chinese people. So I think that's the most important indicators of whether it's 4.7 percent or 5.1 percent. Uh, if the labor market turns around and and uh, becomes stronger, I think that's the biggest achievement for China. Yeah. Well, whatever the number, the actual number, I think one thing we can be sure of is that the, the, the Chinese economy is not collapsing and <laughs> will not be collapsing anytime soon.
I guess, and those who are peddling, <laughs> who killed the Chinese economy theory, I guess they can, they should take a break. And uh, we're coming to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. Many thanks to my guest, Professor Liang Yan from uh, William Meta University, Professor Bert Hoffman from the National University of Singapore, and Professor Xu Qinghua from the Renmin University of China. And that's it for this special edition of The Point. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and X using the handle Lushin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching. You've got The Point.